Okay, so, so yes, so let's, um, let's get going. Um, so this week, our speaker is Melissa Fo. Um, she's a professor of cognitive psychology and head of the Scene Grammar Lab at Goethe University in Frankfurt. There, Melissa and her team investigate aspects of visual cognition, including visual attention and memory, principally during scene perception. To do this, they use a wide variety of techniques in both adults and children, including psychophysics, eye tracking, virtual reality, as well as EEG. So after receiving her PhD from Ludwig Maximilians University, she went on to research uh, at the University of Edinburgh with John Henderson and at Harvard, Harvard Medical School with Jeremy Wolf before joining Goethe University in 2014. Melissa has won numerous awards for outstanding teaching and research awards, including a Vision Science Society Young Investigator Award. So it's a great pleasure that she can be here with us to tell us all about her research. So Melissa, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Alex. Thanks for the invitation also. Um, and thanks to those of you who are here on a Friday afternoon. I totally appreciate you making time for this. Um, I'm excited to show you some of our work. I'm, I'm basically starting broad, um, basically showing some of the, the work that I have done a few years back to kind of set the stage and then moving on to stuff that is basically not definitely not published, but data just rolling in to get, maybe even just pick your ideas and brains about that. So um, reading scenes is the title. Um, we'll, be, we'll be talking about a hierarchical view here. And um, you might wonder why the whole scene grammar lab uh, part here. What does scene grammar uh, mean? Um, and I, I'll try to con uh, convey that to you in a, in a moment. So you've probably never read this particular sentence before, but there is no problem in understanding it, I guess. That is different if I jumble things around, right? So suddenly you just uh, have difficulties understanding uh, the gist of the sentence. Might, you might have difficulties reading individual words. <clears throat> And um, what you can see here is uh, the same is basically true for uh, environments. You've never seen this particular environment, but if I um, you know, let you look around it, you get an idea of where things are, what they are. But if I destroy what we call the grammar of, of where things should be in a scene, then it gets difficult to locate them, sometimes to identify them and um, yeah, that comes along with all kinds of issues. So we're interested in, in this kind of rule governance of the world. So this is also important for object perception, of course, but also um, leads to a lot of the paradigms that we use in a lab, which is visual search. So if I ask you to search for the chalk in the next scene, um, maybe you can unmute yourself for just a few seconds and just clap when you, because I cannot see you, um, just clap when you find the chalk. Okay, so unmute yourself. There you go. I know it's Friday afternoon. You're eager to grab things. The chalk. The chalk should be over here. See, I hear some clapping. Okay, so the, this is should be the chalk. Um, and if I had an eye tracker with me, which I usually have, but I can use your webcam, you don't know it, I can track your eye movements and you probably were doing something like you see in those fixation distributions right here. You started in the center where it was written chalk. And then you probably realized at some point, this is like a blackboard and looked over here. You might've had a few milliseconds thinking, is this really a chalk uh, or is it something else? But that would have been the general direction. <clears throat> The, the message here is basically when we plot the coverage of your eyes in the scene, it usually is very minimalistic. And right? in this case, people only uh, foveated 14% of this uh, scene, which means they were able to search themselves of searching through 86% of, of the entire uh, image here, right? So this is very different from the types of searches that, for example, Jeremy Wolf that I worked with for five years at Harvard Medical School used to do. So usually a lot of the visual search literature is based on finding the white horizontal uh, in the next image. So again, unmute yourself for just a few seconds and clap when you find the white horizontal bar 
amongst other stuff that is appearing. Okay, one, two, and three. Uh huh. Somebody clap. Okay, thank you. There's one. Did you find the second one as well? One down here. Okay. So you probably saw the difference with that, and then I will go into details about uh, how scene grammar uh, actually aids object search and perception. And I will continue with some ideas that we currently have in the in the lab about possible hierarchies within scenes. And I will give you uh, a brief kind of glimpse into what we have done uh, developmental wise uh, with respect to scene grammar, because it also kind of uh, is the, 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 the starting of a few more collaborations that we have with developmental psychologists nearby. Um, so kicking off some other projects. <clears throat> So the first part is me showing you basically that scene grammar aids both object search and, and perception. So just imagine yourself being uh, in France, uh, you're having breakfast, and the thing that you're searching for is uh, the jam jars, right? To put jam onto your beautiful, crusty, yummy baguette in the morning. So you're looking around and you probably um, have done something like our participants did right here. Again, I'm showing you fixation distributions of a participant looking for the jam jars. And there's a few things that you can see, right? First of all, you can see that, again, uh, they don't, didn't cover the whole scene. There was a system behind it. Um, and uh, what you see is that you, they, of course, don't look outside the window. They don't look on the floor. They even just kind of, they look at the kitchen counter, but spare the, um, uh, the stove, right? Because you wouldn't expect them there. So you see there's a lot of top-down knowledge already guiding your attention here. Um, that's what a lot of studies do. You, you search one time, but what we did in this particular study was kind of looking at the uh, importance of guidance of your general scene knowledge, what we call scene grammar also, and your episodic memory for this particular French kitchen that you're in, right? So usually what happens is you don't just search for one object at a time, you, look, you search for different ones because you're making breakfast, right? So you start looking for the eggs, you look around the scene, you find the eggs to the left, you look for a pan to put them inside, that's on the stove, you look for the baguette that they're hidden down here in this basket, of course, in France, you drink wine for breakfast. So where's the wine bottle and the wine and so on, right? So um, mimicking just a typical kind of action related search in scenes. And um, so the prediction here is, is pretty simple. Uh, if you have 15 objects that you're looking for subsequently in the same scene and we're plotting response times of how quickly you find them, if your episodic memory of having been in the same scene for in the end, 30 seconds uh, is something that guides your search, you should be getting faster over time, right? Because you have looked at some of the future targets, you are familiarizing yourself with that scene and so on. Um, what we actually found in this particular study was uh, nothing like that. So we uh, found that people actually were not getting faster over time. And we thought that was really weird. So in the same study, we basically replicated that four times and they never got faster over time. And so that basically led us to believe that um, the, the guidance through episodic memory in this particular scene was not as strong as your general knowledge of, okay, I guess the, the pan will be on the stove knowledge, right? And we tested that also in a different version, same study, where we had um, them basically search for those uh, jam jars the very first time, we had a different group of participants where we told them, okay, look at the scene. You have 30 seconds, memorize all objects and everything about the scene because we're gonna have a memory task at the end of this experiment. We let them do that for I think, 10 scenes. And then we started them off uh, on, um, on their search for the same objects like the other group just that they had already familiarized themselves with those scenes for half a minute. Um, when they then were asked to search for the jam jars, 
they did not get there any faster. Um, they basically uh, went back to using what we call scene grammar, knowledge about where things should be in the scene, instead of going back to their episodic memory of having been in the scene before. So we argued here that episodic memory might just be less efficient than using scene grammar. Uh, it might be faulty. It might take time to reactivate that knowledge. And the world is already out there, right? This kind of notion of outside memory by Oregon is, is basically you, it's there. Why should I memorize all of this, right? It doesn't make sense. I can just look again. And maybe it's even faster to search again, especially when you, of course, and that's something we can talk about later. In a lot of those studies, you just sit there in front of a screen, sometimes with a chin rest, and you're moving your eyes, and moving your eyes is pretty cheap. So you might just uh, search again. And so in this kind of schematic model that we came up back then was, we tried to kind of make the distinction between the type of search I showed you before, the, for the wide horizontal, which is the classic kind of search where you, need uh, or you're guided by features like orientations and colors. You don't have any kind of pre-knowledge of where, of course, this uh, target should be. Uh, you need to need your selective attention to look at certain locations in there to bind features together and recognize the object. And that is very different from the types of searches that we are interested in in the lab. We're mainly interested in real world searches like the ones that I showed you before. And the interesting thing here is that you have a parallel pathway in which you process the scene holistically. And if it's a naturalistic scene, you basically end up pretty quickly knowing that this is a classroom scene without having had to identify each and every object in that scene. And once you know that, that this is a classroom, you might have identified one or two objects, you can use the context to guide your attention, right? So basically, as like we were seeing up here, uh, you then don't have to scrutinize uh, the whole scene, but basically just uh, look at the subpart with the most probabilistic or the most probable uh, locations in there. Um, so what is this contextual guidance that we're talking about? What is this scene grammar specifically? <clears throat> so here's just an example again of how predictions that we have and uh, you know, knowledge about how our world should be biases our perception, right? So you see this person working away, could be a person uh, in Cambridge. This was actually a PhD student in Antonio Taralba's lab at, at MIT. And, and you can see when I show you the high resolution version of this that your expectations probably have been faulty, right? You just expected certain objects to be in the semantic setting of an office and being in certain locations uh, uh, in here. So generally speaking, we have strong expectations regarding on the one hand, what objects fit the scene context and how they relate to each other. And we know that we have similar expectations for words that fit a scene context, a sentence context, sorry and how they relate to each other, the words relate to each other. So very roughly speaking, one could say one is more knowledge about semantics and the other one is more syntax. Of course, um, language people might be in, in the audience would of course uh, rightly so say that there is no clear distinction, there's like interactions of that, but just for the, the sake of uh, simplifying things, one could just kind of test as hypothesis of the, those types of expectations that are more semantic regarding the, the, the global sentence or the global scene versus the relationship of uh, elements like words or objects within a sentence or a scene uh, could be related to, to syntax. So if you translate that really to, to scenes, what does this mean? So when I basically set up a scene and add objects to them, you pretty quickly get an idea that this is an office scene, right? You don't need all of the objects in there. At some point, you know this. And that sets up expectations about what object should be in there, right? So if I, at some point, um, and that, that those are semantic expectations. So if it's at some point, I show you a fire hydrant in this office down here, I don't need to say any, anything about it. You just kind of know that this is weird, 
right? On a semantic level, it doesn't fit into the scene. This is different than all objects in here being semantically fine and expected, but being tossed around, right? So here again, those are expectations that are violated that are not necessarily semantic, um, but could be considered more in a relational scheme, which we would call a syntax. Or you could even do this on a more ex extreme version where you uh, deviate kind of uh, gravity and say, okay, some things might actually even be floating. So their, their syntactic positioning is even totally off and, and defies gravity. So what we had shown previously in eye tracking studies was that if you have people look at a scene like this for 10 seconds and track their eye movements, which you can see as this kind of purple dot moving around here, they were supposed to look at the full scene and memorize all of it. And you can see that that person kind of keeps going back to this weird item on top of the stove. It's, it's a floating printer. So it shouldn't be a printer in the first place on the stove. It shouldn't be floating. And you might even have a hard time recognizing it here because uh, it's out of context. You would have no problem recognizing this as a printer if I would put it uh, into the, the office room that it belongs to, right? So we saw in eye movements that those contextual manipulations affected the way that you're attending to a scene. Um, but we were interested whether brain potentials can actually differentiate between what we have called semantic or syntactic processing of objects in scenes. And why brain potentials? Again, they give us a, a good kind of timing scale that we are temporal resolution that we also have for eye movements. But we know from language processing that there are at least markers that at least give us a tendency to say uh, a manipulation of a sentence, for example, has been more on a semantic or a syntactic level. So if you take a sentence like, <clears throat> every morning at breakfast, the boys would eat, um, versus every morning at breakfast, the boys would plant, um, once you basically show participants the last word, you can see a response in their brain that differs from the control condition to the semantically inconsistent condition. And you can see about 400 milliseconds after you have read the word planned, you see this negative deflection, which is called an N400, that seems to be signaling semantic integration costs. And this is different from manipulations that are not really semantic, but more on a syntactic side. So, Every morning at breakfast, the boys would eat. That is uh, semantically fine, but syntactically incorrect. And what you find here is that instead of a negative deflection, you get a later positivity, which has been attributed to something like syntactic reanalysis of, of the sentence. And of course, if you have garden path, garden path sentences, that is basically led to the, the extreme. So we try to kind of just see if this analogy shows anything of a similarity in the brain responses when we do this for objects uh, in scenes. So here would be a, a control condition where you have a teddy bear in the kid's bedroom and the semantic inconsistency would be constituted by the spear mug. I do have to note that I'm from Bavaria, so this is how I grew up. So it's in Bavaria, if you would run the study, I guess uh, I'm not sure you would get an N400 response necessarily for that, but in the States, when we did that, uh, that is pretty strong because we always rate, let our participants rate the inconsistency. Um, again, this would be a consistent control, a semant or syntactic uh, violation where you misplace an object in a scene would be something like this, absolutely possible. You know, somebody called or somebody knocked on the, on the door and you just kind of left everything as it was. So fine, but unexpected. And then the, most difficult to create stimulus uh, set was the syntax gravity violation where we really had to kind of take fishing rods and had things float in midair and really take pictures of them because we thought that would look most realistically than, than even trying to do a good photoshopping job. So this would be the gravity manipulation. And the trial sequence was pretty easy. We gave them a preview, then we because we didn't want them to move their eyes around in this EG experiment to avoid um, artifacts. We uh, gave them a cue and then the object appeared. In this case, this could have been um, you know, a computer mouse or here a soap dish, which would be semantically inconsistent. 
And what you can do now when you do uh, EEG recordings, you can look at those uh, different time windows. So we know from language processing that this N400 time window would be around here. You would expect any kind of effect of a syntax manipulation in a later time window or positive going. And we know from object processing, like object priming studies, that inconsistencies of semantic inconsistencies might affect something that is called the N300, which is more a perceptual marker, right? That's you categorizing something as, as an object in, in general before you process it semantically. And so we can compare the consistent control to um, a semantic inconsistency. So in this case, the, the soap dish here. And what we found as, as a first check was indeed something that looked like an N400 that we know from language processing. So we get this negative deflection that starts in this case earlier than we know from language processing. So we see this N300 in addition to the N400. Um, and that might signal, in addition to semantic uh, integration costs, difficulties in, in really perceiving and identifying those objects in itself, which goes back to studies of, by Irv Biederman in the 80s that have already shown that on a behavioral level, semantically inconsistent objects are just harder to identify. And that, that might really be the ERP component that, that goes along with that. So the interesting part for us now was to kind of see whether those, what we call syntactic manipulations are just maybe milder versions of the semantic one or are something like qualitatively different. You could imagine that this is just something that is less absurd than having a, you know, your soap dish uh, next to your computer. And so we looked at that, again, comparing against the consistent control and uh, as I said, you could also expect this just turning out to be a weaker semantic response. Uh, and, and what we found instead was we did not find any kind of uh, semantic inconsistency, really, no N400, but we saw something that at least uh, time-wise and also polarity-wise would look more like a P600, which could be something like a reanalysis, again, not of a sentence here, but of the, the scene that you're seeing. And then and as a final kind of um, extreme version of syntax manipulations, we tested that against uh, the gravity of manipulation. And what we found here was that um, we did uh, not see an N400 or a P600. So uh, in a way, semantic integration costs didn't exist because they're semantically consistent with the scene. They're just hovering. Um, we also did not see um, a P600, no reanalysis of the scene. I'll say something about that in a second. What we did see is this kind of perceptual mismatch at the beginning. So it's, it was harder for some people to also recognize those objects when we showed them to them hovering. And the reason why there might not be this P600, so not basically an attempt to reanalyze the scene is that it might just be just such a weird situation, and it might be just so ungrammatical uh, that you don't engage in a reanalysis. And we found some papers um, that in language processing basically argued the same way. If you have sentences that are syntactically unrepairable, ungrammatical, uh, you don't get this, in, uh, this P600 anymore. And so you can just see in the scalp topography is that there do seem to be uh, differences in, in the uh, timeline, but also in the polarity uh, and maybe even the quality of processing those different types of um, uh, object seeing inconsistencies, whatever you want to name them, if you call them semantic or syntactic, or if you call them identity versus structural, that doesn't matter. That does seem to be different expectations that come along that lead to different reactions to those violations of the expectations. Um, so there's uh, Tim Lauer in the lab, who has been in the lab for a long time, um, then at, at some point decided to also do his PhD in the lab, which I was really happy about, who in the last few years published a lot of work on object scene inconsistencies, basically using that paradigm, particularly for semantic inconsistencies, to look at behavioral, but also um, EG effects of different types of context that you could have, showing that, for example, 
um, meaningless textures that, um, so those uh, Putilla Simoncelli textures that contain the same summary statistics of a scene, but get rid of any kind of um, spatial layout information or semantics, they still showed an effect in the EEGs. Also, control as compared to color controls that you might have, uh, he showed that uh, scene and object inversion have uh, their own effects and, and interact with each other, and also has shown that um, other ingredients of a scene, for example, the material properties of a scene affect uh, object processing. And he, he also recently, or it's basically in press right now, um, published a review of that and, and other people's work, of course, um, in a nice chapter that I invite you to read. Um, that is basically the, um, the, the global summary work of his, his thesis in the lab. <clears throat> So to summarize this, this first part, those similarities that we found um, in brain responses between language on the one hand and scene processing on the other might imply at least a similar way of using or utilizing hierarchical contexts that we have. And there's of course also work from uh, music processing that have talked about semantics and syntax, which of course makes sense because we have this temporal succession like in language that is very different in, in scene processing where you have a lot of global information coming initially and then you foveating certain parts, which again gives us a, a temporal succession. And those, this ability to generate predictions from contexts uh, in our opinion allows for the efficient object search and perception that I have shown you that we have found in various paradigms across all kinds of experiments. So the, the question then started really being, how are those predictions set up in a scene? Is a scene just as a scene of a whole or how can we kind of uh, see certain subparts in them and how are they arranged? And so we basically um, started looking into what we call anchors and phrases that are nested within scenes. And I'm trying to explain that to you uh, in a moment. So when I ask you to look for the mirror in the next scene, don't worry, you don't have to clap again, but just try it. Try to look uh, for the mirror here. You'll be looking around and you will see that this is a target absent trial. There is no mirror, right? Um, if you would have asked the contextual guidance model that was uh, one of the most prominent models initially that used context to, to predict eye movements in naturalistic scenes, you would have had this kind of idea that the, um, the mirror should be somewhere not on the floor, of course, not on the ceiling, somewhere in this kind of middle range of the scene. But um, tracking eye movements of participants where we had them search for invisible objects basically revealed that they're pretty good at doing so, even though the object is not there, just by using the context. But the context is not just a broad kind of lower upper context, but actually um, uses ideas about hierarchical predictions we think in the scene. <clears throat> so our working hypothesis here was that scenes are uh, hierarchically organized with what we call phrases centered around anchor objects. And those anchor objects hold very strong spatial predictions about other objects uh, in a phrase. So what do I mean by that concretely in, in this example here? Um, so we have a bathroom scene and you could basically zoom into each part of this bathroom scene by saying this is the shower phrase, this is the toilet phrase, and this is the sink phrase, right? And within those phrases again, and we call them phrases, again, an analogy to, um, to language, this is a, basically a small group of, in this case, not words, but objects standing together as a conceptual unit. So they're forming uh, a component of a scene here that is meaningful, right? It's a meaningful unit. And uh, within this phrase and within this cluster of objects in scenes, um, we found that so-called anchor objects play a very important role for object identification. And of course, localization when you search for objects in scenes. So what we mean by that is we have around those uh, anchor objects, local objects that you might be interacting with, right? So if you are brushing your teeth and you go into this um, into this bathroom for the first time because you're in a hotel, 
uh, you basically know where to look for uh, the toothpaste that might be there that your spouse has already put in or something like that, right? Because those anchors, and this is important about those anchors, they have very strong spatial predictions about where those other local objects should be. So um, the soap should be on top of the sink. Um, the toilet paper should be next to the toilet. The shampoo should be within the shower and stuff like that. So we were wondering if those anchors that we have basically just theoretically thought about actually guide something like search. And we did test this with a flash preview moving window paradigm. You see the preview of the scene. You're asked to look for the chalk and then you have a window that moves around with your eyes to kind of really see if, the, if what the effect of this preview and the information you get from this preview is on your later search. And what we manipulated in here was the presence or absence of anchor objects. So the target might here be a toilet paper and either you see it next to its anchor or we replaced it with something that should also, that is also probable in this um, scene, but um, not directly anchoring this, this uh, object. So in this case, uh, a washing machine. I know that in the States that is an issue, nobody has a washing machine in the bathroom. Uh, in Europe, at least here, and also in Germany, we have that more often. So it's not a, it's not a, uh, not an issue. Um, so we try to really replace those uh, those anchors with semantically congruent um, other objects of similar size. And what you then can do is just look at the performance um, of people searching for those objects. And of course, what you look at first when you do search studies is uh, response times. And you can see here on the y-axis response times when the anchor was present uh, compared to when it was swapped out by a different one, your response times were just uh, uh, much faster than when the anchor was not present. And similarly, when you look at eye movements uh, that people perform in those scenes, you can see that the coverage of the scene also is much reduced when the anchor is present. So they actually really guide your attention to the location when the anchor is not there, uh, your, uh, your eyes are, are less constricted to most probable locations. So this is us saying there are some anchors. So we tried to operationalize those, this concept of anchors. So what we did is basically, again, just kind of borrowing from graph theory, we took uh, image, databases that have all of the scenes fully labeled. So we have each pixel is basically attributed to an object in the scene. We can use the center of those objects to put our nodes on top. Uh, we add edges between those nodes and perform various thresholdings of that, of course. Uh, we find clusters. And in the end, we have um, object to object pairs that we can evaluate. Right, And we can look at the weights and um, change the weights depending on whether some of those objects occur often with each other in close proximity, if they're low in their spatial variance, if one always occurs on top of the other, for example, and whether they occur in the same cluster. And we basically used, in this case, the LabelMe database where you have all those labeled objects um, and computed the statistics or the weights out of that, and then fed them back into our experiment where we had already had the data, right? The eye movement data, reaction time data. Just to kind of see as a sanity check whether um, in general, those objects that we thought of anchor objects would um, load higher on this uh, final anchor weight, which, which did. So first of all, this basically mimics what we were you know, as a rule of thumb, trying to kind of uh, see and get out of uh, the statistics. And what you then can do is, instead of having this binary anchor is there or anchor is not there uh, factor, uh, you can basically put in this continuous measure of anchor weights and see if that correlates somehow with how people perform their search. And you can see that there is a correlation where you see that with anchor weights are stronger uh, they are better at finding those, those objects. So the presence of anchors actually modulates single trial uh, search behavior in those naturalistic scenes. So again, when we ask you to look for the mirror, we think what happens is not 
a very broad way of doing it. You basically locate the anchor uh, of that object. And you know from previous experiences that the mirror should be above, right? And so this is how people are actually very efficient in locating objects in naturalistic scenes. So what role do those anchors actually play when we have people move around scenes uh, and actually perform this type of task in a virtual setting, right? And this was work done with uh, one of my back then PhDs and uh, also a research assistant in the lab who were bringing that into a VR setting. And you can see uh, basically four conditions that came out of two manipulations. We had a perfectly normal scene in VR. We had a scene that was the same scene, but tossed around, right? So you basically, all the objects were just moved in a, in a way that was not congruent anymore. And we had uh, a version where we replaced all the anchors with cuboids, so the fridge, the table, the kitchen counter, everything that could tell us about, uh, you know, where other objects should be. And that would be the mixture of an inconsistent placed scene and, and replacing anchors with cuboids. So I'll just show you that um, in this little video, how this looked like when people were moving around. So this is a perfectly normal scene. Again, this bathroom scene, you look for toilet paper, you use the anchor and find it rubber duck, probably somewhere on the bathtub and so on, right? Um, then the next condition would be replacing those uh, anchors with cuboids. And you kind of see that, it, you know, you still get an idea of what type of room you're in. Doesn't seem to be a huge visual difference that you have when you're searching. We'll look at the data if it does have a difference. Um, then we have inconsistent scenes with anchors. So here you can see that is of course a, a very stark a manipulation in, for you to search because everything is uh, not where it should be. And it's very hard for you to find certain objects in here. And a combined version of uh, cuboids replacing those anchors in those inconsistencies. Those are the four, the four versions that we're looking at now. So what you see, first of all, in terms of reaction times, here are the model adjusted uh, response times, because uh, we're running dynamics defect models here uh, to account for differences in our stimulus material and other things. Um, what you can see here is that um, the response times in consistent scenes uh, is again reduced when we have actual anchors present than when we compare that to a condition where we replace them with cuboids. So you're faster at finding your targets when uh, the actual anchors are present. When we're in an inconsistent scene where everything is tossed around, what you can see that this reverses. So anchors actually there harm you if you have anchors around. First of all, because you need to process their identities, which you don't have to do with cuboids. Um, they basically add more clutter and they might, might actually misguide you as well because uh, you know, the object that you would expect near those anchors are not where the anchors should be or where, where the anchors are. Um, looking at other um, dependent variables with uh, the use of eye tracking in this, as you can basically see the same pattern going through all kinds of other eye movements, uh, eye movement measures like the time you need to first fixate that object, the number of fixations, the scan path length until you get there, even decision time is something that is affected. So if you're just by the time you first fixate the object and then at some point press the button by saying, okay, I found it, that happens uh, faster if you're in a condition where the anchors are present than if they're not present, right? And so this is also showing you that it does not only affect localizing those objects, it's even when you're already there, just recognizing and identifying those objects is, um, is gonna be easier for you um, if the anchors are present. So uh, just as a visualization of what I just showed you, you see fixation distribution in those 3D virtual rooms. For the consistent control, you can see when it's inconsistent, you're all over the place, but you can see even in this, this main comparison that is important for us with regard to the influence of anchors, you can see as soon as the anchors are not there, you still get a feeling of what this room is about, but your guidance is hindered. 
And you can see that with body movements as well. So here, as you can trace where, how people were moving, they hardly move around uh, when everything is in the right place and anchors are present. They of course go crazy when things are uh, inconsistent. But even if you replace those things with uh, gray cuboids, uh, they just um, need to move around more to perform their task correctly. So as a summary of this uh, second part, we can say that anchor objects seem to play a unique role in spatial layout of, of scenes. And we do think that they need to be considered more for understanding the efficiency of real world search and perception. People have not really uh, talked about these. There are of course the ideas of diagnostic objects for um, identifying or categorizing scenes. But this, this particular notion of having certain objects and scenes that, that basically anchor uh, predictions about where other objects should be, is something that I, we think is, uh, is very important for understanding the efficiency of what we've been showing for years now and other groups, of course, as well. Um, a small digression here. So this is a part that is, um, that is uh, far from um, being published. This is the data is just also still coming in, uh, but I just wanted to show that to you in, in case you have any, any kind of ideas on how to analyze the data or what this could mean. So here, what we try to do is we would try to um, basically access the mental representations uh, of people that they have about objects and see whether they also incorporate what we call, you know, different levels of a scene's hierarchy. And so the question here was, do our mental representations of objects incorporate the phrasal structure that I just introduced you to, that we think is, uh, is important, at least when you're searching for objects. And uh, we used a paradigm that I think is very cool that uh, Martin Hebert um, published uh, last year. Basically, a very simple odd one out task. So the only thing you need to do is uh, seeing three pictures, tell me which of the ones uh, is the odd one out, right? And from that, I mean, they did all kinds of different cool other things from there. You can be, uh, you know, build representational embeddings. You can model the data and predict uh, certain similarity responses in here. Um, for us, the, the importance was really um, getting similarity data out um, of each of the responses. So the nice thing about this paradigm is that if I ask you to tell me which one is the odd one out, in this case, you know, you have a pot, a stove, probably you would say that the mouse uh, the computer mouse is the odd one out. So if you click on that object and you choose that one as the odd one out, you get three responses out of this. So you get one similarity response and saying, okay, that's, if you say the odd one out is the mouse, then the pot and the stove are considered similar. And the pot and the mouse and the stove and the mouse are considered dissimilar. So you basically get three values out of one decision that people are making. And what we did is we not only um, looked at this for uh, actual objects, but also looked uh, at um, labels, word labels, referring to those, right? Pot, stove, and mouse. And so what we did is we used representational similarity analysis and, and general minimum mixed effect models uh, together to estimate which predictors explain the representational structure that you can get out of those similarity judgments uh, and, and see how they, how they are influenced maybe by some kind of phrasal structure. So you can build those RDMs um, based on you know, hypothesis that you have. If your hypothesis is that every object that comes basic or that you can find in the same type of scene, so bathroom scenes, for example, they should show the highest similarity and basically no similarity to any other scene and so on. Um, the notion of phrases would be in the way that we selected those objects would be that, you know, sink toothbrush and toothpaste would be a phrase, toilet, toilet brush and toilet paper would be a phrase, bathtub, towel and towel rack would be a phrase and stuff like that. So that would be something that uh, even on top of this um, scene, uh, structure, you might find this notion of phrases in, in addition. Um, so when we basically collected all of those uh, similarity ratings, what we found is actually a really strong effect of 
this uh, seam texture, seam, seam classification or seam level. You can also see that some scenes are also more similar to others. So not just to itself, but you know, the blanket and sofa and you know, living room scenes do seem to have, or objects from those scenes seem to be judged very similarly to objects taken from bedroom scenes and stuff like that. Um, but you do see when you compare this um, from images to words that uh, there might be a little bit more fine grained stuff going on when you look at words. So let's look at this uh, more on a, on a value based uh, version, not just visually. So when I plot the model estimated similarity here as a function of whether the objects that you're judging are coming from the same scene or a different scene, what you can see that you find a really strong effect of people representing objects from the same scene, even though they might look visually very different, uh, as very conceptually similar. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the phrasal structure, you see that it's going in the direction that we were hypothesizing. So um, uh, objects that come from the same phrase within the same scene um, seem to also be um, at least uh, value-based descriptively um, rated as more similar, but we don't see this uh, really showing up in stats for now. That's why we had decided to maybe go away from the images because the problem with images, of course, is that you have all those visual features that you might be basing your decisions and similarity ratings on, right? So there might be something that is gray, another thing that is gray and something that is red. And uh, there might be, you know, different underlying scenes or even phrases there, but you might be judging your, uh, your similarity rating just on, on color or shape or something like that. So when we looked at um, the same model estimates for a version of the experiment where people never saw objects, but just the words indicating or word labels indicating those concepts, we again see this uh, scene structure. This is very strong. So I think uh, representations of objects uh, from the same scene are just very nearby. And we do see now even statistically, um, at least um, first indices that this phrasal structure might also be there even though you're not asked to think about scenes at that moment, you're only seeing individual objects in this case, you're only seeing words. So in those pairwise similarity ratings, we seem to see some, some phrasal structure being reflected within the scenes and that objects from the same phrase were considered as more similar. And this phrasal structure is even more prominent um, when uh, your concepts are not triggered by images, specific images, but by words. Um, and that's probably due to less visual features biasing your similarity in, in other ways, right? Of course, we statistically in our linear mixed effect models, we can also, you know, have them rate visual similarity and, and, and um, add that out or basically uh, subtract that out of the calculation. That is something that we're currently doing. Uh, but I think this uh, effect on, in words gives us a first hint. Okay. This was the part about hierarchies, and now I'm not going to keep you too much longer. This is just another five minutes or so, giving you an, an idea of um, you know, developmental aspects you might um, want to look at when you're studying scene grammar. So here, um, what we were interested in is, of course, that you're not born knowing all those things. We know from the Spelka's work and, and uh, many other developmental scientists that we seem to be born with some ideas, even about gravity, um, and where that are really shown with children as early as three months, two months. Um, but you know, this notion of scene semantics and syntax is a little bit more complex. I mean, knowing that uh, the toothbrush should be on the sink is still something that I, like my two and my four-year-old, you know they sometimes have a hard time wanting to understand that, right? So there's something, how do they learn that? When do they learn that? And maybe other interactions with language abilities with this type of visual cognition. And if so, um, the, the hope here that we had was if we would find those that could serve as a pre-verbal diagnostic tool, right? For finding things, maybe problems of dyslectic children even before they start talking. Um, so I'll start this movie here and 
what you can see is this girl who's two years old uh, or two and a half years old here um, trying to kind of um, put uh, uh, this sink in here. You can see there's two sinks. She's kind of confused. Now she sees that the sink should actually go. This is a sink that goes in the kitchen. And so uh, you can already see that children that age might also be looks a little bit older than two. Uh, we we, we um, tested children between the age of two and four on, on those tasks. They have a notion of where things should go, right? So the task basically was we had this dollhouse that was empty um, except for an anchor object per scene that also indicates the, the basically semantic category of this, uh, this scene. Uh, because it was a very bare dollhouse, as you can see. And so we asked uh, the children to place 52 objects that we had in buckets into the dollhouse in the way they thought it should be equipped. And what we could do there now is to look at into individual differences of those children, which was kind of interesting. You cannot really see it here, but I'm zooming in into some of those rooms. So this is a child one that equipped uh, a bedroom, which looks in my opinion, pretty amazing. I'm not sure my kids would would uh, build a, a dollhouse scene like this. And that is um, the, the difference basically of, uh, of a different child who had a different scene grammar, right? So the grammar here might not have been, uh, you know, book should be on a table or blanket should be um, here and there or the, the, the placemat should be somewhere else. It was maybe size that was important to this kid who put all the big objects into this room and the small objects in a different room. So we had varieties in how they performed. And in addition to this kind of dollhouse uh, measure, um, we also took language scores from children two, three, and four years old. Here, the y-axis, the, the distance means that the closer you are to uh, what uh, adults would be doing, this is, would be basically the better you are, right? Uh, this was our measure here. So the, the lower the value, the better. And what you can see is that for two and three-year-olds, we don't see a big correlation with any kind of language score, but we start seeing some correlation uh, with uh, language scores that we, uh, that we took from those children from a whole set of uh, language. Uh, test batteries um, and saw that there, there seems to be a relation in a sense that the better you are on, on, in your language syntax, the better you performed also in this dollhouse task within the same age range. So placing objects within a dollhouse, which was we call syntax, at least in the study correlated specifically with syntactic language measures. And that started at the age of four. Um, we also, you know, Sabina in her, as part of her PhD work also built up Seagram. So if you're interested in using stimulus material that is highly controlled, um, you can go in and grab that from our website. And what we did here is we had children look around and you can see eye movements um, um, on that cucumber that is the inconsistent version of just socks uh, in the scene. And they don't have to talk to us again, the same as in the dollhouse task. Um, we just look at their eye movements and knowing that usually in adults, people get stuck on inconsistent objects. We can take this as a measure of how aware they were of uh, an, uh, a manipulation on a semantic or syntactic level. That's what I'm showing you here. You have um, fixation durations um, on those critical objects. They were either consistent in green or semantically inconsistent in blue or syntactically inconsistent in red. And you can see that as a function of age groups, two, three, four-year-olds in comparison to adults. And here, what you see with adults is uh, what has been reported also for decades already, that if something is semantically inconsistent or syntactically inconsistent, people are really pulled towards and stay and stuck are stuck on those inconsistencies. What, what you can see developmental-wise is that uh, across ages, it's not that people or children, you know, don't get stuck as long and the, long, the older you get, the more longer you linger on those inconsistent objects. To the contrary, you 
that basically is pretty much the same. What diff differs here is that the, the way that you can disengage, how fast you can disengage from objects that are uh, basically following your predictions, right? And you can see that this is not as strong in two and three-year-olds, but four-year-olds show this effect pretty prominently already for both semantic and syntactic inconsistencies. So starting around the age of four, they spend less time on consistent objects, which might also show us that they have developed certain predictions that when you follow them and something is as you have predicted, you're just faster of disengaging from that location and doing something else. And just a final note, we also ran uh, a study on, um, on two-year-olds using EEG um, and basically found in two-year-olds that we see at least some slight inconsistent objects in scene. So it might be the case that even earlier than four years, um, they're able to, to notice those, those differences. So to summarize, we're of course not born knowing the rules of the world, but it, it seems like the development of language and perception might go hand in hand, or at least the predictions that we have about elements and how they relate to their concept, uh, to their context. So across all of those studies, I think that the understanding of uh, the efficiency of object search and perception in real world scenes by determining, for example, or looking more at the hierarchical structure of our predictions could open up really interesting and new translational uh, opportunities. For example, um, we could improve state-of-the-art object recognition models that are out there by basically building in some of the, the grammatical rules that we're aware, uh, aware of. Or even, and that's something that is now starting again with another set of studies that we're doing with developmental psychologists uh, by providing maybe diagnostic markers for impairments um, of other rule governed learnings like in language uh, that we can base on language less um, tasks like scene perception. So I want to say thank you for your attention. I know it's getting late here in Italy. It's already dark outside and uh, I invite you, of course, to always come. I know this is hard in these, in these times, but you can also visit our website to just find out more about what we're doing in the lab, um, contact us with questions, or if you want to have you know, stimulus material, code, um, we're always happy to share that. So thanks a lot. I'm gonna stop sharing because otherwise I don't see anybody. <laughs>